markings that are left on the breach face of the casing, so on the rear part. Um, if I can show you this part of the region, that's what I'm looking at. That's where the caliber is located. That's where I can look at the um, at this metal part. This is where I can look at the breach face markings and the fine finishes. So after looking at all eight casings, I was able to determine they have very similar class characteristics. Um, at that point, I take them to the forensic comparison microscope, which is basically two compound microscopes joined by an optical bridge with a binocular lens. So you can look down, you can actually look at both casings side by side, and there's a hairline that I can separate, and I can actually overlap them in this, uh, using the forensic comparison microscope, and I can view them side by side and be able to determine whether they were made by the same firearm. In this particular case, I was able to identify M cases and that they fire the same firearm. So does that mean that you are able to say, based on your expertise, that all eight of those casings came from this firearm that you examined before? Yes, once I compare those casings to the test fires of the, of the firearm. Okay. Now, you also said that you have the ability to examine projectiles. Yes. How is it that you do that? In a very similar way, I look at the projectiles. Um, most often times, they're, they're clean prior to my examination in my presence, so I have complete uh, custody. I know where everything goes in the, protect, uh, the specific pill box and how it's labeled. Um, they're usually cleaned with uh, peroxide and bleach solution, not at the same time. Uh, and then they are scribed with a case number, um, my initials and badge number. And there are, I weigh them to find out to determine that kind of helps to get what's called a grain weight. Uh, projectiles, I can determine sometimes the, uh, the caliber of the projectile from the grain weight and the diameter of the base of the bullet. Uh, so combining that, I was able to determine that I believe six of the, I'm not sure I can't remember. Um, you need to uh, look at your report to refresh yes. my question. By all means, please, go ahead. Uh, yes, please. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is So I'm looking at these lands and groups. 
through. So when it goes through the barrel, these are the markings that I'm looking at under the microscope. So there's some deep parts of the firearm that this goes through, and they make these scrapes on the bullet. So those are, that's the area of identification. So when I put this under a comparison microscope, this is one stage, so under one microscope, and this is under the same microscope, a different the other side. When I'm looking at them under the stereo of the comparison microscope, I look at them just like heroin, and I can actually look at it like this. It looks exactly like this. So here's one bullet that I'm going to hold stationary, and I'm going to rotate the other one until I can line up. You can see that there's little markings that are here. And I'm trying to... Ms. Ross, right, 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 I don't want you to walk around, but I need you to not talk to one particular juror. So if you don't mind providing your explanation as a whole, and then you can show the jurors individually if they can't see in the back. Thank you. Well, there are scratches here. So what I'm... They're basically essentially scratches. What I'm looking at is I'm trying to find... I'm rotating until I find scratches that line up from one side of the hairline to the other. And once I find those in agreement, which I can show you in the video, I can now rotate both projectiles together. Both projectiles together to see that there's... they're from a common source. And obviously, if you don't find that they line up, then you would not be able to say that they were from a common source. In this case, I can say that they were fired from the same firearm. If I don't see the same agreement, then I don't come to that conclusion. Okay. Good. Thank you. Judge Mavroch. Thank you. You showed me what's been marked for identification as State Exhibit 1D. Do you recognize 1D? Yes, I do. Okay. How do you recognize 1D? I recognize my initials and badge number and the date, as well as the case number and my initials and badge number on both sides of the bag. Okay. What is 1D? 1D appears to be a bag of the pillboxes containing projectiles. Okay. And is it in the same condition as when you last saw it? Yes. The seals are intact with my initials and badge number. Yes. Judge, I'm offering this into evidence subject to linking it up with fellow officers, et cetera. Defense? Subject to linking it up. Yes. So it will be admitted at this time, subject to that linking. State Exhibit Number 144. I'm sorry, 144. Thank you, ma'am. Would you give it back to me? Please. Thank you. You can go ahead and open the bag. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are these the projectiles in this case that you examined to see if they came from that firearm that we've been talking about? Yes, they are. Okay. And the projectiles, again, you said there were nine, I believe. Is that right? I believe there were a total of ten. Ten. So that's A through J. Is that right? I think it went to I. Okay. You – so explain the process. You take each one of these out and you compare it as you just showed the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Yes. I take the projectile. In this case, I made these boxes because they came in a small metal envelope. Okay. What I do is I clean the projectile and then I make a pill box like this with the case number, my initials and badge number. I mark it as evidence and whether it's A through I and a small description of what was on the envelope that I received it from. Now, you said there were six that you were able to identify. Seven. Seven. You tell me. Eight. Okay. So that means one you were not. Two I was not. Okay. Before we get to those two, okay, I'm going to ask you to open one of the ones that you were able to identify, please. Okay. And if you could tell us what letter that would have been. This is letter A. Okay. Okay. And I'm just going to ask permission for her to publish the projectile to the members of the jury. Yes, you may. Go ahead. Thank you. 
please step down and just show the link members of the jury. And again, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you need to stand to be able to easily see what she is showing you, you may reposition yourselves. So it was your conclusion that that those projectiles came from the same gun that we've been talking about, the 380 person that you tested? Uh, yes, the projectiles A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and J. Okay. Um, let's talk about projectiles H and I. Okay. Okay. Could you please explain why you were not able to say whether those projectiles came from that firearm? Uh, those two projectiles labeled, that I labeled H and I I cannot identify them to the firearm because they were just fragments of a copper jacket. <coughs> so there wasn't enough information, um, uh, individual markings on that on those pieces of metal to make an identification to other projectiles or to the firearm itself. What is a copper jacket? Well, most bullets, not all, but most bullets are composed of a lead, a lead core, a soft metal core with a jacket around it to keep the to keep from dirtying up the barrel, fouling the barrel. Most often that jacket is made of copper. It's also a soft metal that can accept the markings from the barrel of the firearm. Um, in this particular case, these projectiles are jacketed hollow points, and those are meant to expand and pieces can fall off of the metal, the metal jacket tends to fall off of the material and stuff on them. When you say hollow point, I'm sorry, could you explain what that means? Uh, bullets come in jacketed round nose, which means they're just, um, if you look at it, actually, if you show you my monster That's the same age we've been talking about. Yes, the same one. This is an example of a jacketed round nose, a full metal jacket, where it's completely a rounded nose, and it would just mostly stay in this, in this condition um, after being fired. However, um, the projectiles in this case were hollow point, which means there's an opening here that you can actually see into the core of the, of the projectile itself. The point of hollow points is when they come in contact with the target, they open up and expand. So when they create pedals, they're made to actually expand. So imagine my fingers as pedals, and they open up and break off, and sometimes those pedals on impact from air or whatever, um, they can break off and become fragments. I'm going to ask you to please open H and I and publish those to the jury so they can see what that looks like. Roberts, while you're putting those away. You can't say because they're in fragments that they came from that firearm, correct? Not necessarily. It's just that there's no information on those particular fragments. I, th if there was um, markings similar to what's on this uh, demonstrative aid, I would have been able to make a possible. So it doesn't mean that they didn't come from the gun, you just can't say before because of the number of lines. Correct. Okay. Um, were your conclusions reviewed by anybody else? 
um, that I had to do it technically reviewed by a coworker of mine. Okay, and why is that done? Is that it's just part of our standard operating procedures when there are um, casings or projectiles identified to a firearm uh, that a fellow coworker with the same training, the same expertise, uh, comes in and looks into the microscope and sees exactly what you saw and you can confirm. I have no further question. I'd just like to allow her to just put the stuff back in the bag and give it back to the clerk. Please take a moment to do Perfect. that while she's Thank preparing. Thank you. you can, if you'd like to engage in a cross, just take her a moment. Sure, Judge. Just let me know when I can. Thank you. 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 My name is Sam Zangman. I represent Mr. Medina. I'm going to ask you some questions with regards to your investigation. Okay? Did you conduct testing pursuant to an instruction from the Homicide Bureau? Uh, I guess you could say that on the lab analysis request that comes with the property to the evidence, um, usually there's an analysis request. And on this one, it's that, um, it said routine ballistics. What we normally do, uh, we compare projectiles and cases to so pretty much, you're matching the bullets to the gun. The bullet and all its components to the fire in the question, correct? If that's possible, yes. And that was possible in this case, correct? It was. Did you have any meetings with Detective Grossman or anyone else involved in this investigation prior to doing your analysis? Not to my knowledge, no. So the testing that you did that you proffered in front of the jury this court was limited to what you testified to today, correct? Yes. One of the things that you mentioned or you testified to was single action versus double action trigger pulls during your, your direct examination. Do you recall that? Yes. And just so, I, just so I'm clear on this, because I really didn't follow, can you explain to me what the distinction between a single action and a double action is? Of course. Um, a single action, um, basically when you pull the trigger, it performs one action, which means dropping the hammer so that it pops. Um, whereas double action is when you pull the trigger, it's not it's performing two actions. It is now pulling the hammer to the rearward position under spring tension and then releasing it. Which would result in a fire discharging a, a projectile in a quicker fashion? Both are possible. If you have somebody that has a single action firearm versus someone that has a double action firearm and they both are exerting the same amount of pressure, will one fire shoot quicker than the other? It depends on the reflexes of the shooter. If they're exactly the same. If we have two identical individuals shooting two, set, two firearms, one that's single action and one that's double action, and this is obviously a hypothetical, which would result in a faster or quicker discharge? I can, I can attest that a single action trigger pull is lighter than a double action trigger pull. So if you're using the five and a half to six and a half, six and a half pounds of weight like I was describing a single action trigger pull, it, then you would fire a single action and would not release a double action trigger. And that's because it's quicker to get five, to five and a half pounds of, of, uh, of pressure versus a higher number, correct? Yes. The firearm in, in, in used in this homicide was a 380 auto versa pistol model thunder 380cc, correct? Yes. Is that a single action or a double action? It is both. In the firearm that you, in this case? Yes. It's both? Yes. When you tested the firearm, you did four shots into the apparatus, correct? I did. And the shots were at your leisure, correct? Yes. And they were conducted in a controlled environment, correct? Yes. And you agree with me that there's a difference between firing a firearm in a controlled environment versus a real life scenario, correct? Possibly. Well, if I'm coming at you with a knife and you've got that firearm, that's substantially different than you sitting in your in your in your office conducting this experiment, correct? Objection relevant to her expertise. <laughs> Did you test, you didn't test the, the firearm, well, let me, 
Did you do any kind of testing to see how quickly this firearm could, could, did you do any testing to see how quickly the firearm could empty the clip in this case? This is a uh, semi-automatic pistol, um, as opposed to a fully automatic pistol. A fully automatic pistol would mean you can pull the trigger and it will keep firing until there is no more ammunition left in the magazine. Uh, this particular firearm is a semi-automatic, which means a separate pull of the trigger is required to shoot the gun each time to release one cartridge. So, Ms. Roberts, I'll ask the question again. Did you do any testing specifically with this firearm to see how long it would take to empty the clip in this firearm? No, we did not. Okay. Did you do any tests with this firearm to check the propensity for quick fire and double fire defects with this firearm? The firearm was functioning in satisfactory operating condition, which means as received, it would not perform any, uh, any malfunctions. It would only fire when the trigger was pulled. And you pulled that trigger four times? Uh, four times for test firing, multiple times um, for testing the safety of the firearm during my workup. So how many times in total did you, did you fire the firearm? At least seven times. And once again, under controlled circumstances in your office? Yes. Do you have the ability? When you look at the actual projectile in these cases, the ones that were presented, your duty and your job was to match these projectiles to the fire, correct? My job was to see if the projectiles match the fire. You didn't do any analysis to see the manner in which or how they were damaged or how they how they got into their into, into the position that they were in when you received them, correct? Any sure. Once a firearm projects once a firearm is used and a projectile is expelled, are you able to determine what caused the malfunction or the abnormalities in the shaping of the projectile when you're examining it? Sometimes I can. Sometimes you can see... Um, well, well, Ms. Robbins, I, I'm talking about... I apologize. Let me rephrase. With regards to this case, did you do any testing with regards to that? No. I know that they didn't ask you to do this, but did you do any specific testing or research on the Versa 380 model Thunder 380, I'm sorry, the, the auto, auto Versa pistol model Thunder 380cc? I did the normal amount of uh, research on the firearm to find out uh, the, the manufacturers, what type of finish it has, what its safeties are, how they function, uh, that kind of research. To your knowledge, is this firearm um, prohibited for sale in any of the 50 states in the United States? I'm not I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. You may continue. And your answer was you didn't. You don't know, correct? Give me a second. No further questions. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Can you direct? Yes. Yeah. Do you recall being asked on hi again? Do you recall being asked on um, cross examination just now about rapid fire testing or how fast? I want to say testing. Um, how quickly the bullets can be um, ejected or shot from the gun? Yes. Okay. And um, you said that you didn't do any of that. Correct. Why not? But, um, in my testing and in my in my uh, experience. The firearm functions in satisfactory operating condition, and therefore the gun can be fired as fast as the, the shooter can pull the trigger, release it to allow the action to reset and pull, so that can happen as quickly or as slowly as, as, that, as the trigger can be pulled. Okay. You know what? Could I have the firearm now, please? Uh -huh. May I approach? Mm -hmm. There's been so much talk about single action and double action, and that this gun is both. Using the actual gun that we have here, could you explain what you mean by single action and double action? What one needs to do if one is firing in single action and if one is firing in double action? Can you just, just demonstrate on that particular gun?
Do you remove the strap on the firearm, or can I just show? You can just show. Yeah, okay. you cannot remove the strap. Thank okay. you. Sorry. <laughs> the gun is, um, is safe. It has the strap. May I call the picture? You may stand down. Is that right, Judge? I'm sorry. Yes, that's fine. Uh, so this is a first offender to the ACT. So I can move this slide back so that's how it functions. So you can see right here that there is a, this is what we call a hammer that's mildly exposed here. The slide is pulled back a little bit for the straps so you can't see it completely clearly, but you can see this uh, This is a little hammer, this little metal projection. So in double action, this hammer would be completely rested up in this location here, and by pulling the trigger, it would go pull the hammer back and then release it, and that would be double action. Where a single action would be, you can move the, the, the hammer back either with your thumb or by sliding, moving the slide rearward, which would also move the slide back. So, so and then by pulling the trigger, all it has to do is release the hammer to the resting position. And would that explain why you need? There's less pressure associated with the single action than the double action. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask you how to see just put the firearm back in the back. examination about the um, projectiles yes. and their condition. Yes. Okay. Um, in the course of your examination of the projectiles in this case, were you able to examine their condition and whether they were in pr pristine condition or not? They were, um, the majority of the projectiles had a very, um, they were all jacked with hollow points, the ones I was able to make identifications with, which means they had, um, we call it a mushroomed nose, when the uh, hollow point makes contact, it spreads open. So if, when I showed you projectile A, you saw um, some gray metal, that's, that's the inside, so that's the, the nose, that's the lead core of the projectile, and that opens up and blossoms and opens the trunk under it. Beneath that is the base of the bullet that takes all of the, um, the fingerprint seal from the barrel of the firearm. Those were all in good enough condition for me, for me to make an identification. Thank you, you are. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Detective, please make sure all of your answers are out loud so all of our jurors can hear you. Mr. Dunn, when you are ready and he is comfortable, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Can you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Yes, my name is Jonathan Rosen. And what is your current occupation, sir? I'm a police detective. For whom? The Miami-Dade Police Department. How long have you been employed with the Miami-Dade Police Department? I've been with Miami-Dade Police Department since 2011. And what is your current assignment? Currently, I'm assigned to the Criminal Investigation Division, assigned to the Homicide Bureau. And how long have you been assigned to the Homicide Bureau? Since January of 2013. And do you have any prior law enforcement experience before Miami Dade? Yes, I do. I was a member of the Miami Dade Schools Police Department, and I spent seven years there. And can you uh, explain to the jury a little bit about how the Homicide Bureau within the Miami Dade Police Department is organized? Sure. Uh, 
the homicide bureau was, at the time of this case had two platoons, and day platoon and an afternoon platoon. And there we had four teams on each. And we had team one, which would have been up for any homicide or police law shooting. And team two would handle any other death investigation that would come into the office. Now, were you on duty back on August 8th of 2013? Yes, I was. And on that date, were you assigned to investigate a homicide under Miami-Dade Police Department case number PD-1308082913? Yes, I was. Please tell the jury how you became involved in this investigation. Our team on that particular day was team one, so we were up for the homicide or police law shooting. Those were our normal hours, and the homicide call would come in from the city of South Miami Police Department. And were you assigned as the lead detective in this investigation? Yes, I was. What was the address where the homicide occurred? The address was 5555 Southwest 6th, 7th Avenue, apartment 105 in the city of South Miami. And is that in Miami-Dade County, Florida? Yes, it is. And does the Miami-Dade Police Department handle homicide investigations for the city of South Miami? Yes, we do. What was the name of the deceased? The deceased in this case was Jennifer Alfonso. Can you please tell us where you first responded to upon receiving information about this investigation? When we first received the call, we left our headquarters building, and we went directly to the scene at 5555 Southwest 6th, 7th Avenue. And did you enter the residence? Yes, I did. Were you riding with anyone at that time? Yes, on that date, my partner at the time was Detective Jim Hatson. Call him ready to talk, please. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I was riding that day with Detective James Hatson, who was a member of my team. Upon arrival at the scene, did you enter the residence? Yes, I did. For what purpose? We entered the residence so we can have a picture of what occurred there earlier in the day. We also did it as a security sweep as well, just so we can see it, observe what's there. At which point, when I exited, we instructed the South Miami officer to stay at the door and not to let anybody else in. And what are you waiting for before you conduct your full and open search of the residence? A search warrant. When you were in the residence for the brief walkthrough, did you have a chance to observe the deceased at that time? Yes, we did. And where was she in the apartment? Jennifer was located on the kitchen floor. Can you please describe the position of the body as you observed her upon her initial entry into the residence? Certainly. When we entered the residence and we observed Jennifer on the floor, she was bent on her knees. The arches of her feet were flat on the ground. She was leaning backwards and her head was up against the cabinet doors. Did you observe any physical evidence around the body, again, during your initial walkthrough? Yes, we did. And what did you observe? There was a firearm. There were several shell cases. What, if anything, did you do next after you completed your initial walkthrough of the scene along with Detective Hatches? We exited the residence. As I stated, we instructed the South Miami officer not to let anybody else in. In my direction, I assigned Detective Lee Medeiros, who was also a member of my team, and I assigned her as a scene portion of the investigation. And what did you do next in this investigation? We then started speaking with several of the officers outside of the residence, and that's where we learned that a photograph of her was uploaded online. Online to what website? Facebook. And what did you learn had been uploaded to Facebook? A photo of Jennifer on the floor of the kitchen, as well as a posting. And what did you do upon learning this information? Our sergeant at the time was Sergeant Kevin Gallagher, who instructed him to work whatever necessary to have a photograph of Luke in Facebook. And do you know if the photograph was, in fact, removed or how it was removed? Yes. We have a digital forensics unit that works within our police department. My understanding is that they work with the state attorney's office cyber crimes unit, and in conjunction with the two, they were able to get a photograph of Luke in Facebook. At some point in your investigation, did you make contact with a person who later became known to you as Derek Medina? Yes, I did. Do you see Derek Medina in this courtroom? Yes, I do. Can you please point to him and identify him by an article of clothing? 
He's seated at the defense table with a suit, white shirt, and gray tie. Does the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant? Where did you first make contact with Mr. Medina, the defendant? At the Miami-Dade Police Department's Homicide Bureau Office. Who transported Mr. Medina from South Miami Police Station to the Miami-Dade Police Department Homicide Bureau? Officer Matthew Taylor of the South Miami Police Department. And was this the same day at the homicide, August 8, 2013? Yes, it was. What time did you make contact with Mr. Medina at the Miami-Dade Police Department? The first time I made contact was in, I believe, the short walk at 3 p.m. And where did you make contact with Mr. Medina? Inside one of our interview rooms. What was his demeanor? He was calm, collected. We went and started preparing to process him. Did you ask him if he was under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or medication? Yes, I did. And what was his answer? He was not. And in your experience as a police officer, have you had an occasion to observe persons who were, in fact, under the influence of drugs, alcohol, or medication? Yes, I have. And based on that experience, did it appear to you that Mr. Medina was under the influence of anything? No. Did you ask him anything about whether he had suffered from any mental illness? Yes, I did. And what was his answer? No. Did the defendant appear to be coherent? Yes, he did. Did you ask him about his educational level? Yes, I did. And what did he say? He advised me that he obtained a bachelor's degree from Florida International College. Were you speaking to the defendant in English? Yes, I was. Did he appear to speak fluent English? Yes, he did. Did he appear to understand you the way you were speaking to him? Yes. Did you have any trouble understanding his answers to you? No. At some point, did you take a statement from Mr. Medina regarding the homicide of his wife, Jennifer Alfonso? Yes, I did. And prior to taking that statement, what are you legally required to go over with him? We're legally required to go over his Miranda warnings. Was he considered to be in custody at that time? Yes, he was. Did Mr. Medina waive his Miranda warnings ultimately and agree to speak with you? Yes, he did. Were any other detectives present while you were interviewing Mr. Medina? Detective James Hodges. Your Honor, for the record, I am showing defense counsel what has been previously marked as States 9I for identification. May I approach? Detective, I'm showing you States 9I, which has been marked for identification. Can you please take a look at it and tell me if you recognize that exhibit? Yes, I do. And how do you recognize it? This is the Miami-Dade Police Department Miranda warning form that I went over with the defendant. And does that have your handwriting or signature on it? Yes, it does. Now, when you're administering these Miranda rights, do you read the form to Mr. Medina or does he read it to you? No, he read the form out loud to me. Okay. Why did you have him do that? It gives us an opportunity to make sure he is able to read, number one. And it also allows me to make sure he understands what he's reading. Did the defendant have any questions about the rights as he was reading them out loud on the form? No. Did he ask you to explain anything further? No, he didn't. Does the defendant sign and date the form after reading all the rights? Yes, he did. Okay. And does he also initial the form after each one of the rights? Yes, he did. After he's done signing and initialing the form, who else signs and dates the form? I sign as the advising officer and Detective Hatzis signed as the witness officer. Your Honor, at this time, the State Rule 9I is up. Any objection? No. So moved. At this time, Detective, could I ask you to please read the form aloud to the jury just as Mr. Medina read it to you when you were administering these rights to him that day? Certainly. Before you are asked any questions, you must understand the following rights. You have the right to remain silent and you do not have to talk to me if you do not wish to do so. You do not have to answer my questions. Do you understand that right? And is there an indication for him to indicate whether he understands or not? Yes. And what is that? His initials next to the yes column. Why don't we actually take a look at it on the big screen so the jury can see along. Your Honor, may the witness step down. Yes, ma'am. 
My initial supplemental. Okay. Thank you. Can you just set that in front of you, put it, turn it over, and if you need to refer to it as you're testifying, you may do so. Can you begin by telling us, according to Mr. Medina, what was his relationship to the victim, Jennifer Alfonso? The defendant was married to Jennifer. And how long had they been together, according to what he told you? Approximately four years. 
And did you obtain any history as far as the background of the relationship? Uh, yes, during our discussion, the defendant stated that he was married with Jennifer, that there was a brief divorce, and then they remarried. Did they have any children? No, they did not. Did Jennifer have any children? Yes, she did. Who? Isabel Vieira. How old was Isabel at the time of these events? Ten. During the pre-interview, did Mr. Medina give you a statement about what occurred between himself and the victim that led to her death? Yes, he did. Can you please tell us what Mr. Medina told you happened from the beginning? Certainly. Mr. Medina uh, began speaking to us and advised us that on Wednesday, August 7, 2013, he spent the evening at a marina with Jennifer and Isabel uh, here in Miami. Uh, they returned home around 10.30 p.m. and he was supposed to wake up Jennifer around 1.30 so they could spend some time together and watch some TV or a movie. Um, he elected not to wake her up to allow her to sleep, uh, to stay sleepy, and he advised that around 9.30 in the morning, she woke up, and a, an initial argument between the two took place in the upstairs bedroom. An argument because what? Uh, she was upset that he didn't wake her up. And what did Mr. Medina say happened next after Jennifer became upset that he didn't wake her up to watch the movie together? The defendant stated that the argument escalated and that Jennifer began throwing things at him. What did she say he was throwing? Or what did he say she was throwing? Pardon me. Towels, mascara, and then formally talks about how it was uh, anything she could get her hands on at that time. Okay. And in response to Jennifer throwing towels and mascara at him, what did Mr. Medina say he did? Uh, Mr. Medina stated that he got up out of the bed, he went to the closet, retrieved the firearm, and pointed it at him. And what did he say or do upon pointing the firearm at his wife for throwing towels and mascara at him? He directed her to stop. And what did she do then? She then stated, you're not going to shoot me, and made a statement to him that she was going to be leaving him that night when he went to work. Now, you said that you've been a police officer for a number of years, correct? Correct. Right. So, the weapons at this point that have been involved are towels, mascara, and a firearm. That's correct. And how many homicide investigations have you conducted, would you say, in your entire career? I, I probably participated in close to 50 homicide cases in police emotions. And out of those cases, how many death by towel cases have you investigated? None. How about blunt mascara trauma deaths have you investigated? None. Mr. Taylor, are you with us? Yes. Thank you. So let's continue. After Jennifer told Derek that she was leaving him for good, what did Mr. Medina say happened next? Uh, he says that she exited the room and she went downstairs. And then what did he do, if anything, according to his statement? He returned the firearm to the holster and placed it in the closet inside the room. Uh, and then he later said that he went downstairs, uh, at which point a second argument began. And what happened downstairs during this now second argument in the kitchen after Mr. Medina fought his wife? He stated that uh, she was pushing him, and uh, at some point during the argument, he decided he was going to go back upstairs, retrieve the firearm, uh, and again return downstairs to the kitchen argument, to where the argument was. Now, did Mr. Medina say whether Jennifer was following him or chasing him or continuing to attack him as he went upstairs? No. So what happened next according to Mr. Medina's statement? <laughs> he stated that he retrieved the firearm from the upstairs bedroom. He placed the firearm in his waistband uh, so that Isabel would not see the firearm. She was in an upstairs bedroom as well, not the same bedroom that he retrieved the gun from. He says that he then begins walking downstairs he places the firearm in his right hand, um, enters the kitchen area, and says that Jennifer then grabbed a knife. After he entered the kitchen with the gun, she grabbed a knife. Objection, Judge. Grant? Leading. Sustained opening question, please. So to be, to be clear, according to Mr. Medina's statement, at what point exactly did Jennifer 
pick up the knife after he entered the kitchen with a uh, firearm. What happened next, according to Mr. Medina's statement? Mr. Medina then described for us, uh, and he used, uh, in my direction, Detective Hatzis to demonstrate how he disarmed Jennifer uh, the knife. Can you describe for the jury what Mr. Medina described to you as far as how he was able to disarm his wife of the knife? Sure. He said that he had the gun in his right hand, that he placed the gun into his left hand, that he reached across, grabbed her hand, then pulled the knife out of her hand, at which point he placed it in the kitchen drawer and closed the door. After disarming his wife, what did Mr. Medina say happened next? that she began to hit him, and that he fired him. Did he state how many times he struck the victim? Six to eight. What did he describe, if anything, of the victim doing after he began shooting? He described the facial expression that she had, um, and he continued to say that he emptied the clip. What happened after he finished shooting his wife, according to his statement to you? He changed, and then prior to leaving the residence, he took a photograph of the victim uh, of Jennifer on the kitchen floor. And what, if anything, did he do about Isabel, according to his statement? He stated that when he entered the upstairs to change, he instructed Isabel to stay in her room and not to come downstairs. What did he then do with the photograph that he took? After taking the photograph of Jennifer, he uh, made a posting and uploaded it to his Facebook page as well as her Facebook page. And did Mr. Medina indicate putting any comments along with that posting? And this is and what did Mr. Medina admit to writing on Facebook along with the picture of his dead wife? I don't recall verbatim. It was Is there a judge something that would refresh your recollection? Certainly, Mr. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you please take a moment and refer to your report? Then look up when you're ready. About what time did this occur that Mr. Medina complained about injuries and you called fire rescue? 
May I refer to my report? Yes, you may. For the record, Your Honor, I'm showing counsel what has been marked for identification as States 1F and States 9K for identification. Your Honor, As always, according to the clock, it is now 2.40. I will ask that you be at the other end of the hallway at 2.50. Please leave your notepads behind and remember my orders as always. Please rise. Please uh, hope that the jury leaves the courtroom first. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you may exit the courtroom. Thank you. 